Okay, welcome to session nine, physical security, session nine, under information security principles. Under physical security, we will concern ourselves with physical access controls, the fire security and safety. We will look at some failure of supporting utilities and structural collapse. We will look at interception of data, look at mobile and portable systems. Then we will end the session looking at certain special considerations for physical security. So let's start off. With this, physical security addresses design, implementation, and maintenance of countermeasures that protect physical resources of an organization. As the name implies, physical security. So we are securing physical assets, physical resources. And physical security is as important as logical security. The most controls can be circumvented if an attacker gains physical assets. Okay, there are seven major sources of physical loss that we would want to talk about. The first one has to do with extreme temperature. Then we have gases, we have liquids, we have living organisms, we have projectiles, we have movement, then energy anomalies. These are seven major sources of physical loss. So we can lose, we can have physical loss by through extreme temperature, through gases, through liquids through living organisms, through projectiles, through movements, and through energy anomalies. OK, so we'll look at physical access controls now. Now, to secure a facility, you realize that with a physical lo location engineered with controls designed to minimize risk of attacks from physical threats is what will fall under securing a facility. So to be able to secure a facility, we're looking at putting controls that in place to be able to make sure that the risk of an attack to a, or a physical threat to a physical location is minimized. Then secure facility can take advantage of natural terrain, traffic flow, and degree of urban development. Physical controls can also complement these with protection mechanisms. So this is the case where we can have your physical location uh, protected by a fence, by a gate, by a wall. You can put bodyguards, you have alarm systems, and so on and so forth. Now, physical security controls include, like I've mentioned initially, in addition to the gates and all that, Having walls, fences, and gates, you can have guards, like I've mentioned, you can have dogs. This is a case where you have ID cards and badges being given to authorized persons so that they are able to have access to that physical location. This is where you put locks and keys on your doors and all other rooms that you don't want any other persons who are not authorized to go into. Then you have man traps, you have electronic monitoring, you put CCT cameras around, you have alarm systems, computer rooms. You wire your closets and so on and so forth. Then you do interior walls and doors and so on and so forth. So these are just expansions on the things that I have mentioned. So we have lock and keys. As you can see, you have ID cards and badges. You are usually concealed. You have your name on it. Visibly, everyone can see that you are authorized person with your picture and so on. Some others go beyond and have thumbprints, retinal scans, and so on and so forth. The same with keys. They still feel safe in some offices. Besides the normal door, they have the safe where you can actually have pin codes and so on and so forth. All of these things is just be able to achieve physical security. So these are controls that are put in place for that. These are pictures just mimic locks that are in existence. And when we say man traps, what are man traps? If you look at the picture, you realize that it is a small area that is that has two doors. So there's one that you can enter through from the inner then there's one that you can enter through from the outer. These are all based on your organization setting, controls that you can put up for physical security. Then we have electronic monitoring. I mentioned the CCTV and all that. 
even though the city cameras do not necessarily prevent access, it gives you the ability to monitor what is happening, to be able to know who has entered the system, who is not authorized, and who is actually authorized to enter the system. We have alarms and alarm systems. So you set alarms in places where authorized persons can go with certain ability, and if the, anyone goes there unauthorized, they have an alarm blown, then you have security persons come around to come and pick up whoever has caused such an alarm to blow, and so on and so forth. Where we put sensors to be able to detect things. You have motion sensors, and so on and so forth, smoke detectors, temperature detectors, and so on and so forth. We have computer rooms and wire closets. Now, these places usually require special attention to ensure that CIA is maintained. CIA is our abbreviation in the information security world. We maintain confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Then we look at interior walls and doors. These are all expansions on physical control that can be put in place to allow for physical security to be enforced. With that said, we'll take a look at fire security and safety. Now, the most serious threat to safety of people who work in an organization is possibility of fire. Fire accounts for more property damage, personal injury, and death than any other threat. Now, it's imperative that physical security plans examine and implement strong measures to detect and respond to fires. Now, let's look at fire detection and response. Fire suppression systems, well, devices are installed and to help to maintain, to detect, and respond to fire. So, it is necessary that you have um, fire extinguishers to be able to keep fire in this occurrence because fire is something that is not predicted. Anything could cause a fire, it could be ignorance and so on and so forth. Now how do we detect fire? Fire detection systems fall into two general categories. We have the manual, we have the automatic. Now part of a complete fire safety program includes individuals that monitor chaos of fire evacuation to prevent an attacker assessing officers. At the outbreak of a fire, we need certain personnel who are going to be put in place to make sure that even though there's an outbreak and evacuation is happening, unauthorized persons do not take advantage of that evacuation to have access to offices to pick up files and information that they are not supposed to have access to. Now, there are three basic types of fire detection systems. We have the thermal detection, we have smoke detection, and flame detections. Now, when we look at fire suppression, it's a system that consists of a portable manual or automatic apparatus. Now, the port that's the portable extinguishers that we have ratings for, class A, class B, class C, class D, and so on. These are usually installed systems that apply suppressive agents usually either sprinkler or gaseous system. So this is the usual fire extinguishers, the portable and the bigger ones that you see around, all to help to be able to keep fire, to detect and to respond to it. So this is a water sprinkler, usually found in some, if not all offices, to be able to help to keep fire. So this is a chart also that indicates how sensors are put in place of a, using the gaseous fire suppression system so that in the event of a fire, using this particular system, we'll be able to help to respond to the outbreak of fire. Now let's take a look at failure of supporting utilities and structural collapse. Now supporting utilities like heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, power, water, and others have significant impact on continued safe operation of a facility. Each utility must be properly managed to prevent potential damage to information and information systems. Now, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, these are areas within, you see the areas within heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems that can cause damage to information usually include the temperature, their filtration, their humidity, and their static electricity. You can also look at the ventilation shafts. You know, while the ductwork is small in residential buildings, in large commercial buildings, it can be large enough for an individual to climb through. So if when we are considering physical security, you might want to have in mind that because it's a big organization, it is possible for 
attackers to want to physically come into the organization through some of these ducts that are part of the structure of the building. So if the vents are large, security can install wire meshes to be able to block the vents so that it's difficult for any human being to walk through those vents to be able to have access into the building. We'll take a look at the grounding and the amperage. Grounding ensures that retaining flow of current is properly discharged to the ground. So you might want to be able to keep especially fire by taking a very good look at your grounding and amperage because in the event of any electrical surge, lighting or so ever, your building should be able to receive whatever the electronic discharge is and push it straight to the ground so that you don't cause a fire and by that causing damage to the facilities physically and also that of the information system that you have within your organization. So there are so many other things to look at to look at UPS, be able to protect data which is being used. So you have your computer systems running UPSs which are the uninterruptible power supply so that if there's any power, you don't lose your data immediately and so on and so forth. You have time to back up, to shut down and wait for a response to the problem that is at hand. So this is a, a chart that shows the types of UPS supplies and this is hard from American Power Conversion Operation. Then we'll take a look at emergency shutoff. It's an important aspect of power management and here A power shut off is the need to be able to stop power immediately so the current represents a risk to human or machine safety. You should be able to have the ability to shut off, have an emergency shut off. Anytime you are of the view that it's a possible risk that is being posed to a certain human or a certain machine safety. And most computer rooms and wiring closets are equipped with an emergency shut off. Yes. So if you're an organization, you might want to pay close attention to your emergency shut off. Take a look at another major problem, which is water, with regards to physical security, water. Now, a lack of water poses problems to systems, including functionality of fire suppression systems and ability of water chillers to provide air conditioning. If you are having water problems, it could pose a very big challenge even to the infrastructure of the building that you are running your business in. Surplus of water or water pressure poses a real threat. So in excess of it is also a danger because you could have leaks or flooding. Lack of it is also not good because it could affect the air conditioning and the chilling ability of water chillers to provide the right kind of air condition that you need. So you must note that you need it in this right measure. Having water problems could be a very, very big challenge. Now it's very important to integrate water detection systems into alarm systems to regulate overall facility operations. Take a look at structural collapse. Unavoidable forces can cause failure of structures that house organizations. Now, structures designed and constructed with specific load limits. Overloading these limits results in structural failure and potential injury or loss of life. Here, we could say that it is important to know that we obey the standards that the structure that we are working within states. And to note that we do not over lose them to be able to bring any collapse that we did not see coming. It's important to maintain our facilities and by doing that we might want to know that physical security must be constantly documented, evaluated and tested. Also documentation of facilities configuration, operation and function should be integrated into disaster recovery plans and operating procedures. This is very important. We always need to have a documentation of every single thing that's happening with regards to facilities, the configuration, the operation, and every single thing that has to do with their functioning so that in 
planning for a disaster recovery will know exactly what operations and what procedures are that lie therein to be able to go by. Let's now look at interception of data. There are three methods for data interception. We have direct observation, interception of data transmission, and electromagnetic interception. Then we'll talk about mobile and portable systems. Now, with the increased threats to information security for laptops, handhelds, and PDAs, mobile computing requires more security than average in-house system. Now, we are, we've moved so much into a mobile world that it appears that we need more security for our mobile systems, more than that, the kind of systems that we usually have in-house. Now, many mobile computing systems, they have corporate information stores. So most organizations issue out mobile devices to their workers. So when they walk around, they can actually work on the go. With that, it means that we need to have a very close uh, concern for how we are going to secure such assets that are handed on. Now, some of these are configured to facilitate the user's access to organizations' secure computing facilities and so on. Now, control, support, security, and retrieval of lost or stolen laptops. So, a lot of organizations put measures in place to make sure that when these mobile equipment that have been handed over to their personnel are lost by theft or damage, they do not lose the information that they have on it. Or if it's through theft, whoever has had access to those devices does not have access to the information and so on and so forth. We'll look now at remote computing security. Now, remote site computing is simply having access to the organization's facility when you are away from the organization. Then when you are looking at telecommuting is when you are computing with telecommunications, including the internet, the dial-up, the lease lines, and so on and so forth. In remote computing security, the employees may need to access networks or business trips. So when they're on business trips, they might, want, they might have the need to access the company's network. And the telecommuters need access from home systems or satellite offices. So there's a lot of remote computing these days, and there's a need for remote computing security to be given a very critical look. Because most employers allow for telecommuters and for business trips of their employees to be able to have, make the employees have access to the network of the company to access relevant information for the business. Then lastly, we'll look at the special considerations for physical security. As part of special consideration for physical security threats, we need to develop physical security in-house, or do we need to outsource them? Now, many qualified there are many qualified and professional agencies, and many of them benefit, out, they benefit from outsourcing, which helps them to gain experience and knowledge of other agencies. Now, the downside of this is that it includes the, a very high expense, and there's loss of control over individual components, because when you outsource, you do not have total control of some of the components that are going to be bought in to be able to help provide the kind of security that you want for your information. And the level of trust that may be placed in one in another company, it also brings the downside of how much you can trust that outsourced, uh, that company you have outsourced that particular aspect of your security to. You never know when they might turn around and use that as um, a black hole for you. We want to look at social engineering under special consideration, which is usually the use of people's skill to obtain information from employees that should not be released. But this also happens. So there's just some special considerations for physical security threats. Each time you want to develop physical security in-house or you want to outsource, you might, you might want to be careful of these that we have mentioned, social engineering, then the experience at which 
you are going to outsource that particular information program or software to another company besides yours. We'll take a look at inventory management. Now, computing equipment should be inventoried and inspected on a regular basis, just like any other organization, any other inventory system does. That's for computer equipment, also must be done. We need to be able to classify information and it should also be, the information that has been classified must also be inventoried and managed. Physical security of computing equipment, the data storage media and classified documents varies from each organization. So with that said, let's have a brief summary of what we have run through with regards to physical security. We've, we've learned that threats to information security, that, that they are, we've realized that threats to information security are unique to physical security, yes. We've also looked at the fact that physical security monitoring component exists to be able to help us to manage how we control our physical assets. We've looked at paying attention to fire safety, fire detection, and how we respond to fires. We've looked at, as part of the monetary components, so many ways to secure using dogs, swipe cards, keys, locks, etc. We've also looked at countermeasures to physical theft of computing devices. And with that, we will have come to an end to this session. Hope to see you in the next session. Thank you.